True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. You know, most of us have some compulsions or obsessions, but what if your compulsion was to poison people? Then you'd be well on your way to becoming a killer. As a child, Graham Young began experimenting with poisons. By the age of 14, he was using his family as subjects. His father, stepmother, and sister suffered from episodes of excruciating stomach pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Then, while Graham was still a teen, his stepmother died from one of his poisoning experiments. Graham would ultimately confess to the murder of his stepmother and the attempted murder of other family members. He was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for several years until he was determined to be rehabilitated. What his doctors didn't know was that Graham had spent much of his time in the hospital reading medical texts to improve his knowledge of various poisons. He had honed his skills to include extracting poisons from plants growing on the hospital grounds. His stepmother's murder was just the beginning of his career as a deviant killer. Join us at the quiet end for the teacup poisoner. Graham Young's crimes were reprehensible, causing prolonged and miserable deaths for his victims. But Graham was nothing if not detail-oriented. A diary would be discovered in his home, noting dosages, and the effects of each poison on each person. So we're across the pond for this one, as we say, in jolly old England, and I picked a beer called Yorkshire Stingo from the Samuel Smith Old Brewery in Tadcaster, England. This is an English strong ale, 8% alcohol by volume. Pretty nice one. It's a cherry amber color, sort of a medium-sized tan head, nice aroma, some caramel and dark fruit, The taste is of raisin, caramel, a little bit of hops come in late, and those hops give you a little sharpness in the mouth. Mm, I know what you mean. I love that feeling. It was quite good. Yeah, well, open up one for me and come join me over here. Okay. All right, Dickie, why don't you go ahead and start this? I like these older cases because I feel like I'm getting a bit of history here. History of what? Well, it happened in history. It happened in the 60s. Okay. So in September of 1947, Molly Young gave birth to her and her husband Fred's second child, Graham Frederick Young. Molly had developed pleurisy while she was pregnant. Pleurisy is kind of a nonspecific term for inflammation of the lining of the lungs. In 1947, this could be a very serious condition. And in Molly's case, the pleurisy was due to tuberculosis. That's a fairly deadly disease back in those days. And in fact, just three months after Graham was born, Molly died of tuberculosis. So this left Fred Young to care for a new baby, as well as his eight-year-old daughter, Winnie. And at the same time, he also had to work full-time in his job as a machine setter. So there was a lot on his plate. It did turn out that he was unable to raise his two children alone. So Graham was sent to live with his Aunt Winnie and Uncle Jack, while his sister moved in with Fred's mother. Graham was still a baby when this happened, so he easily bonded with his aunt and uncle. Although he did seem content as a toddler and young child, he was unusual. He didn't show any interest at all in playing sports or games with other kids. He was often seen quietly sitting and rocking, as if soothing himself. And that's exactly it, as we see that in kids all the time. That has some neurologic or psychologic problems with the rocking. Maybe he was on the spectrum. You know, that wasn't something they really diagnosed back then. Could be. But certainly he did have mental issues. When Graham was two and a half years old, his dad, Fred, remarried. And his new wife, also called Molly, was now available to be at home and raise the kids. So he brought Winnie and Graham back home to reestablish his family. Fred eventually purchased the house that Graham's aunt and uncle were renting and set up home there with Molly, Winnie, and Graham. It started off rough. Graham was very upset to be separated from his aunt and uncle. 
The trauma of having been taken away from them after losing his mother as an infant may have had a really profound effect on him emotionally and psychologically. It wasn't long before people started to notice that he really was an odd child. By the age of five, Graham entered school, but he never felt like he really fit in. In 1958, Britain had this two-tier secondary education system. When children were 11 or 12, they took an exam called the 11 plus. How they performed determined the kind of high school they would attend. Children who failed the exam went to a secondary modern school, which basically focused on children who would go to work after they graduated, so more of a blue-collar focus. The children who passed went to schools which focused more on an education that prepared them for going to university. Graham Young passed the exam, I guess just barely, and then he was sent to Neesden's John Kelly Secondary School. He had already shown an interest in chemistry, so his father bought him a chemistry kit as a reward for passing the exam. Now, I must say this is really disturbing to me that you would have a child determine what they're going to do with their adult life by a test they take when they're 11 years old. They certainly don't do that anymore. No, they don't. But that's that's how it was. And it's, what, 60 years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, things are still kind of that way with college prep courses and things like that. But I really just hate to put a kid into a mold before they're fully grown and have a chance to explore and decide. Well, I don't think that's an absolute. You could go to a school that was focused more on kids working after graduation, and and if the child does show some aptitude, they could get into the other school. Well, I suppose, but I do feel like it puts them at a disadvantage because they're not getting that kind of support right from the get-go. And if a kid flunks the test, he probably feels bad about him or herself and might not have that motivation. So it's an aside, but it's certainly something that I'm glad they're not doing anymore. Because Graham really wasn't an exceptional student, he was just good at chemistry. Since he was just 10 years old, he'd shown that interest in chemicals. He liked to get into his stepmother's perfumes and cosmetics, and he did some simple experiments with them. But it turns out that he was also huffing the chemical vapors to get high. (laughs) Of course, his father didn't know that at the time. He's a pretty smart little kid. Yeah, in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah. So Graham learned about the active ingredients of common over-the-counter medicines. In fact, whenever someone in the family took some kind of medication, Graham would explain to them how it worked. This was impressive when he was still very young, but less appreciated were the details that he really liked to share about how much medicine would cause them to overdose and how it could kill in those large doses. Little disturbing that he was already starting to be fascinated with that. Oh, that's for sure. Now, his father, Fred, began to worry that some of the chemicals Graham was playing with were dangerous. What Fred didn't know was that Graham was already poisoning animals by the time he was a 12-year-old. Dead frogs were found in the yard, and the family cat became violently ill more than one time. Also by age 12, Graham was always talking about how much he admired Adolf Hitler. He claimed that the dictator had been misunderstood. you got to remember, this is less than 15 years since the Nazis had killed millions of people and bombed the nearby city of London. So Graham had begun wearing a swastika patch on his clothing and even wore it to school. Of course, the teachers told him to take it off, but he refused. British schools were very strict disciplinarians, and his defiance got him in a good amount of trouble, and he also got some corporal punishment. He was already known as an unusual kid, and he was a loner. He never really tried to socialize with his peers and spent most of his time alone, either playing with his chemicals or reading history, you know, especially World War II, and medical texts and chemistry texts. His adoration of Adolf Hitler really scared off most of his classmates. Many were the sons of men who had fought in World War II against the Nazis. Every local family had experienced and suffered from Nazi air raids. A lot of them had lost a family member, and almost all of them had had to live off of government rations. The Nazis were the vilest enemies, and Graham's admiration for their leader wasn't only offensive, it was really upsetting. And Graham also liked to talk about the occult, claiming that he was a member of a coven. He identified as a Wiccan and later as a Satanist. 
and he convinced some of his classmates to participate in rituals that he made up for himself. Real Satanists don't practice animal sacrifice, and in fact they oppose it. Most believe such rituals are about being obsessed with death, and they say that they believe in celebrating life. But Graham didn't care about the details. He just enjoyed the rituals. In one of them, he killed a cat. Later, neighbors said that many cats had disappeared around this time, wondering if their pets had been used in Graham's sacrifices or as test subjects for his poisoning experiments. <laughs> this kid must not have had very many friends. He didn't have any friends. <laughs> He liked Nazis. He liked Hitler. He was into he was messed up Satanists and ritual sacrifices and stuff. Holy cow! Yeah, and I think his stepmother did have some idea about this. Until 1972, it really wasn't difficult to buy poisons in England either. Strychnine, which causes horrific spasms in its dying victims, had been very popular as a rat poison. Arsenic was universally used to kill weeds and insects. Unfortunately, because its symptoms appear a lot like those of many common diseases, it was also used to kill people. In fact, this happened so often that arsenic was given the nickname inheritance powder because it speeded up you getting your inheritance if you used it on someone who was going to leave you money, obviously. Yeah, you got to check the will first and make sure you're in, in the inheritance. That is crucial. Eventually, doctors began testing for arsenic whenever somebody died unexpectedly, especially from heart or liver problems. That's when more murderers started to get caught. If a poison gets used enough, doctors will start looking for them. So Graham likely had read about some famous poisoning cases, but he really felt like he could outsmart everyone. And for a while, he did. He did get away with it, actually, more than a while. In February of 1961, his stepmother, Molly, started to suffer from recurrences of this mysterious illness. She would have bouts of nausea and vomiting, then diarrhea, and excruciating stomach pains. At first, she was the only one in the family who was ill. But soon, Fred also suffered some agonizing stomach cramps, where he couldn't work for long lengths of time. But then the symptoms would stop as quickly as they began. Graham's big sister, Winnie, who was by then 22 years old, was sick twice that summer. And then Graham got ill, too. And at first, this strange illness seemed to only strike the young family. But then a couple of boys at Graham's school suffered the same symptoms. Now, one of the boys was named Christopher. Graham was not good at making or keeping friends, but Christopher was also a science lover. Graham's extraordinary knowledge and abilities in chemistry were enough to get the boys to spend time together. They would eat their lunches together on school days and sometimes swap their sandwiches. So Christopher began to suffer intermittent attacks of stomach pains, nausea, and headaches, and his doctor diagnosed him with migraines. Well, sometimes Christopher's illness was very convenient for Graham. Once he had arranged a date with a girl who Graham also liked and wanted to date, and Christopher had to back out because he suddenly got sick that same day. Graham was able to go in his place. Some of their schoolmates were convinced that Graham had done something to Christopher. Graham already had a reputation among his peers as a real weirdo, and they had nicknamed him the Mad Professor, and not in a good way. Kids in Graham's class were disturbed by some drawings he showed them as well. There were drawings of hanged bodies with syringes labeled poison sticking in them. Fred Young really had no idea about what was going on at his son's school, but he did start to have concerns about the illnesses in their home. In November 1961, Graham made a cup of tea for his sister Winnie before she went to work. It was so bitter that after one sip, she dumped it in the sink. An hour later, she was riding on the train and she began to hallucinate. By the time her train reached her station, she had to be helped from the car, and a concerned passenger called an ambulance for her. In the hospital, the doctors diagnosed Winnie with belladonna poisoning. So belladonna means beautiful woman. Italian women used to make a liquid from it and drip it into their eyes. It dilated their pupils, and they thought that made them look sexy. It has another name too, though, Deadly Nightshade. 
five berries or just one leaf contain enough tropane alkaloids to kill an adult, but it does have an extremely bitter taste. Well, that would limit its usefulness as a poison, wouldn't it? Yes, but it didn't take a lot, so even the one sip was bad. So Winnie told their father, Fred, about this incident, and the suggestion of a poisoning made him think of Graham and Graham's obsession with chemistry. It had been two years since Fred had prohibited Graham from doing experiments in the house. This happened after he had set fire to his bedroom desk. But it never occurred to Fred that anything evil was happening, because, after all, Graham himself had been sick a few times. But Fred was worried that his son had been somewhat careless with his chemicals, so he decided to talk to him about it. Graham denied any responsibility at all. In fact, he blamed his stepmother. He said he had seen her mixing her shampoo in their teacups, and so it was her fault because she hadn't washed them properly, he said, so she had made Winnie sick. Now Fred went ahead and searched his son's room anyway, but he didn't find anything. He warned Graham to be careful with his hobby, and that was the end of it. Well, this mysterious sickness came and went, but in Graham's stepmother's case, it always returned, and it was always worse. By early 1962, Molly was losing weight and losing her hair. She had recurring back pains, and she looked like she was really aging prematurely. She looked terrible. Winnie later described her stepmother as wasting away in front of our eyes. So she certainly got the brunt of it. Yes, she did. It was April 21, 1962, when Molly's illness took a very serious turn for the worse. She had a stiff neck, and she had numbness in her hands and feet. She tried to work through it and went out shopping. This was the day before Easter, and she had a lot to get done for the holiday. But when Fred came home for lunch, he found Graham watching Molly from the kitchen window as she was writhing in pain in the backyard. She had collapsed on her way home, but then instead of helping her, Graham just watched her suffer. Fred rushed his wife to the hospital, but she died later that same evening. By now, Molly's medical records showed that she had been increasingly ill for a long time. She had also been involved in a bus accident the year before, where she'd suffered a mild head injury. An autopsy was done, and it showed a bone in her cervical spine had slipped out of place. So the pathologist had concluded that this had happened in the crash, and it had somehow later led to her death. What do you think about that? Does that make sense? None whatsoever. That's what I thought. It's, it's just a huge stretch. Remember, her symptoms were a lot of GI symptoms. So the slip disc or whatever it was in her neck wasn't going to cause that. And weight loss, I, I just don't know how they could come to that conclusion. Well, it was a while ago, but still, I'm, <clears throat> I'm with you. So Fred arranged for his young wife to be cremated, and he planned the funeral. Afterwards, there was the buffet meal at the Young's house. And on the kitchen table, there was a dish of mustard pickles, which only Fred's brother John liked. Now that evening, John had severe nausea and vomiting. Well, yeah, and also after Molly's death, Fred's illness worsened. The stomach pain got so bad that he felt like he would be dead soon, too. He had himself admitted to the hospital and ended up spending weeks there. And the doctors diagnosed him with poisoning. They were working to determine where the poison had come from, and believed it was either arsenic or antimony. Graham visited often with his sister Winnie, and he loved to talk with the doctors about his father's condition, even joining in on their medical discussions. He was just fascinated with it. Eventually, the tests came back confirming that the poison was antimony. The levels showed that one more dose would have killed Fred. So as Fred stayed in the hospital and his health did improve, he asked Winnie not to bring Graham along anymore when she visited him. He later said that he didn't actually suspect Graham at this point, but he must have wondered what the hell was going on. You would think, wouldn't you? Yes, it was very weird. People outside of the Young family were definitely suspecting that Graham had poisoned his family members. I guess it's just a hard thing for a father to believe. Well, of course, particularly that method. I mean, if he's that intent on doing harm to a parent. There'd be other ways to do that. Oh, yeah, but he loved this, this stuff. This is pretty sadistic. 
Very sadistic. I think he really enjoyed the suffering, especially if he had a grudge against someone, which I think he did have a grudge against his stepmother, although that would be denied. You would think he'd have some resentment towards her because yeah. when she came along, he, he had to leave his aunt and uncle's house where he was being raised and they, they loved him, he loved them, and boom, he's in with his step monster. Well, sure, although she was a nice lady by all other accounts. Yeah. And it certainly didn't take any kind of grudge or problem for him to poison someone. He would just do it for the hell of it for fun. Right, he did. I think he just focused in on her more because he probably did have a grudge. So Graham's chemistry teacher, Mr. Hughes, did not enjoy having Graham as a student. You might think he would have been the star pupil, but it wasn't so. Actually, the teacher was very worried about the experiments that Graham was doing. First of all, they required a lot more knowledge than Graham had from his classes. Second of all, they were super dangerous. Mr. Hughes began to worry that they were purposefully dangerous. You know, at first he tried to believe that the experiments Graham wanted to do just happened to involve these poisonous substances. But eventually he realized that really the poisons were the main reason for Graham's interest in those experiments. So one day, filled with a lot of concern, Hughes searched Graham's desk after he had gone home, and what he found in there was just nothing short of alarming. Yeah, in his desk there were a bunch of the drawings that he had shown his classmates previously, images of dying or dead people. Most of them had a chemical-related aspect to them. One popular theme was on hanging men over vats of chemicals. Then there were essays that he had written about famous poisoners throughout history. So these findings really shocked Hughes, and it convinced him that Graham's interest in poisons was way more than academic. So he contacted the police. Well, yeah, I mean, he was aware of the stepmother's death and the father's illness. Mm -hmm. The police probably already had their own suspicions about Graham Young, too, because they were very interested in what Mr. Hughes had to say to them. What Hughes had found in the desk suggested that Graham was in poor mental health with very violent thoughts in his head. With no actual evidence, the police really wanted to figure out if Graham had acted on these thoughts. So what they decided was to work along with school officials to trap Graham and figure out what the hell was really going on here. Yeah, so the first part of the plan that they came up with was to tell Graham that he needed an interview to discuss his future career plans. Now, this is a fairly normal thing. Many 14-year-olds choose which subjects they want to study until they're 16, and then it's reevaluated. In this case, though, things weren't what they seemed. The career advisor was actually a police department psychologist, and instead of talking about grades and possible careers, the psychologist steered the interview to the topic of chemicals and from there to poisons. And by stroking Graham's ego, it was easy to get him to talk. Once he got started on poisons, he didn't want to stop talking. And he revealed enough to the psychologist that he was convinced Graham was responsible for the poisonings. Yeah, so police brought Graham in, but during his interview, he just denied everything. But, you know, as he was vigorously denying poisoning anyone, a vial filled with a metallic powder fell out of his pocket. And this would turn out to be antimony. So he finally did break down and confess to the killing of his stepmother. But it was more out of pride than sadness. Winnie Young believed her brother had had a really close relationship with their stepmom. But he actually hated her. His classmates were interviewed by the police and many said that Graham had carried a doll stuck with pins. And he bragged that this was a voodoo doll of Molly that he was using to put curses on her. Molly probably hadn't shared Winnie's ideas of them being a happy family. One time when she took away a mouse that Graham had killed with one of his poisons, he got angry, and he drew a picture of a tombstone and left it on the kitchen table where he knew she would find it. And on it he had written, In Hateful Memory of Molly Young, R.I.P. Graham was only 13, when he started his poison collection. He had used a fake ID and his impressive knowledge of chemistry to convince two local drugstores that he was 17 years old, which was old enough to buy poisons legally. 
By the time the police caught up with him, he had stocked up on enough poison to kill over 300 people. Now he showed the police his two hiding places. One of these was in a hedge near his house, and the other was in a neighbor's backyard shed. Using someone else's shed it really showed incredible hubris, or stupidity, or probably both. I think both, <laughs> yeah. He had been under suspicion after someone blew a hole in it the year before with a homemade bomb. And as it turns out, that was Graham's doing. Right, so he just really didn't think he was going to get caught for anything. He had actually saved a collection of four different poisons. So one was digitalis, a foxglove extract that can be used to treat some heart conditions. So in large doses, it can cause hallucinations, nausea, stomach pains, and eventually it can cause a heart attack. Yeah, the thing it was to prevent can actually happen if you give too much of a dose. Yeah, expand on that just a little bit. Well, digitalis or digoxin is used in heart conditions. It basically gets the heart to pump more effectively. So and if you give too much, you kind of overburden the heart and have a myocardial infarction. In the appropriate dose, it makes the contractions more effective. So they can pump blood better to oxygenate the body. Mm-hmm. In higher doses, does too much of that and causes an infarction. So if you don't need it at all, any amount could be dangerous, correct? You could probably get away with a tiny amount, but yeah, small amounts can affect non-cardiac people. He had another poison, thallium, and that's a toxic metal, one time used as a rat poison, but then it was banned for being too dangerous to humans. The other two poisons that Graham had in his collection were metalloids, arsenic and antimony. All of these are extremely dangerous substances, and just collecting them in such massive quantities pretty much showed an intent to kill people. Yeah, I think the police really saw it that way, black and white. Now, his first experiments had been done on some boys at his school, but that wasn't any fun for him. As soon as the boys started showing the effects of the poison, they stayed home. So Graham couldn't observe their symptoms or give them additional doses. His family turned out to be much better test subjects because he had access to them around the clock. And as any good scientist knows, it's better to have close observation of your subjects. <laughs> well, that's true, yeah. He told the police that he had started off by dosing his stepmother Molly's food with antimony. Then he expanded to Winnie and his dad. The police asked him if he'd poisoned himself to throw off any suspicions, but he dismissed that idea. The times he'd gotten sick, he said, he had just mixed up the plates a couple of times and eaten the wrong food. Getting ill himself, though, hadn't discouraged him from continuing, which you think it might, right? If you're getting that ill, you might say, boy, I better stop doing this. This is awful. Well, you would think. You would think, but, but not for Graham. Graham was so intent on seeing the effects on other people that a few little setbacks like him accidentally or maybe not accidentally ingesting some himself, that didn't matter. No, you're right. He actually said that it grew on him like a drug habit except it was not him who was taking the drugs, but his family. Graham really explained these crimes as being without motive, but just simple experiments, something he'd done out of an obsessive interest in chemistry and morbid curiosity. So that satisfied Graham as an explanation, but the authorities and psychologists didn't believe it. Graham had hated Molly, and she was the one who got the most poison. The doses of antimony she ate were causing permanent damage to her health as well. That prolapsed vertebrae that the pathologist had blamed on the bus crash was actually a very common symptom of long-term antimony poisoning. Wow. Yeah, something I wasn't aware of. Me either. No, and it'd have to be pretty long-term, high-dose stuff. Well, yeah, I guess it is common in long-term use because he'd been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And then something else was happening with Molly as she was being poisoned. And this is actually something unexpected, by Graham anyway. What happened was by surviving the repeated sublethal doses, Molly was slowly developing an immunity to the poison. Graham had expected Molly to keep getting sicker until she died of what looked like a long, undiagnosed illness. 
but each dose had less of an effect on her. So on the day before Molly's death, he switched from poisoning her with antimony to poisoning her with thallium. Now Molly's dinner that night had enough thallium in it to kill five people, which turned out to be enough for her to die the next day. Yes, and that was Good Friday's dinner. Unfortunately, Molly's body was cremated, too, so the only evidence connecting Graham to her death was his story and then some observations from other people. To get a murder conviction, the police needed more than the confession of a mentally disturbed 14-year-old boy. But then he also confessed to poisoning his father, his sister, and that classmate, Christopher. His dad, Fred Young's doctors, had already diagnosed him with antimony poisoning. And Fred also recalled that his episodes of illness had usually occurred on a Monday. Every Sunday, he went to the local pub for a couple of pints before lunch. And for the past year or two, he'd let Graham come with him. The medical records of Winnie and Christopher showed signs of antimony poisoning, too. And every illness they'd had occurred soon after Graham had had a chance to poison either their food or their drinks. So together with his confessions, the evidence was enough to convict Graham, and he was found guilty of attempting to murder Fred, Winnie, and Christopher. They couldn't do anything about Molly because she'd been cremated and they had no evidence. But he was sentenced for a minimum of 15 years. Well, didn't he confess to killing his stepmother? Yeah, but they didn't think that was enough to convict him of it. They needed backup evidence. But these were very serious crimes, and there was this widespread assumption that he had murdered his stepmother. Jill, what are you burning out here? Bodies? (laughs) Well, no. I'm throwing in all of our earbuds and headphones with a little bit of lighter fluid as my protest against podcast ads in my favorite shows. I'm just getting into a story, or I'm dozing off, and it's interrupted with commercials. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. (laughs) Nice movie reference. Anyway, let's just simmer down here. You do know that our True Crime Brewery listeners have the option to subscribe to our premium show for ad-free episodes and bonus episodes. It costs as little as $4 per month, and these contributions help support the cost of producing TCB. Well, of course. I love and appreciate our subscribers. You know, I worked for weeks with our IT girl to set that up, and all because I have a deeply held belief that our listeners shouldn't have to hear ads. That's well said. Now, let me ask you this. How are we going to record this week's episode without our headphones? Oh, for fuck's sake. Well, you stay here. I'll go get the hose. Okay, hurry. So the judge ordered him to serve his sentence in Broadmoor, which is one of England's three high-security psychiatric hospitals. It's quite notorious. It used to be known as Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum. (laughs) That says it all right there, doesn't (laughs) it? That's when things were just more to the point. But it was built in 1863, and its first patients were all female. Male patients began arriving within months, and only the most dangerous, violent criminals were sent there. By 1902, the building had six blocks for men and two for women. One of the male blocks was set aside as a POW camp for mentally ill German soldiers during World War I. So it was never really a prison, but it was like a prison in many ways. A prison for people with mental illness who were violent, pretty much. Yeah. Now, in 1951, there was a criminal named John Straffen who was sent to Broadmoor. He liked to strangle animals. But then in 1951, he strangled a five-year-old girl, and three weeks later, he strangled a nine-year-old girl. There were witnesses, and he was arrested immediately, and that's when he was admitted to Broadmoor. In April of 1952, he escaped and strangled another five-year-old girl. So this guy, Straffen, was definitely insane, but he was moved to London's high-security Brixton prison. He was tried and sentenced to death for murder ended up dying in prison. But his escape terrified the locals. Sirens were installed to prevent future escapes. 
And by prevention, this this was where if a siren went off, the surrounding area would be blocked off by police and all cars would be stopped and searched. Sounds to me like by the time the siren goes off, the escapee has escaped. Well, sure, but at least that way they're trying to catch them. And security reviews and updates strengthened security. And by the time Graham Young was confined there, the buildings were identical to a maximum security prison. Well, when Graham entered Broadmoor, it was 1962. His windows were barred, and there was a high brick wall topped with barbed wire. So escape was pretty much impossible. And Graham was known to be very dangerous. He had killed someone. The public was protected from him. But what about the other inmates? They were really vulnerable to his homicidal tendencies. I mean, it wasn't a prison, so he did have some freedom there. Yeah, he could mingle. Yes, absolutely. So just a few weeks after Graham got to Broadmoor, an inmate named John Barrage died from cyanide poisoning, and the staff was just completely perplexed. The cyanide compound responsible for most cyanide poisonings is hydrogen cyanide, and this is a very toxic chemical that does have some industrial uses. But there was none of this chemical at Broadmoor, at least not that the staff was aware of or could locate. Graham actually laughed at them as they tried to find the source of the poison. He told them, you need to search the property. Then he pointed out some dark green bushes that were growing around the hospital property. This was cherry laurel, and the leaves held cyanogenic glycosides. So all he had to do was crush the leaves to extract the hydrogen cyanide. But for some reason, that staff just pretty much disregarded his confession. The buildings were also filled with insane murderers who all wanted to take credit for the poisoning. But John Barrage did die in Broadmoor of this poisoning. And they knew that a notorious poisoner was living there with him, Graham. Graham had written to his sister Winnie and complained about Barrage's snoring prior to Barrage's death. Not that he needed a reason to poison someone, right? But the snoring may have helped him decide who his victim would be. But Winnie, ever trusting and loving her brother, never notified the hospital about the things that her brother was writing to her. You know, given Graham's history, it's, it's kind of shocking that Barrage was the only poisoning death while he was at Broadmoor. One morning, the staff did notice that their coffee smelled like bleach. Turns out someone had added Harpic into the employee's coffee pot. They knew where this came from. It was used to clean toilets. But they couldn't prove that Graham was responsible. However, the staff then began to share some dark humor over it. Other inmates, they would say, you better behave or I'll let Graham make your coffee. (laughs) So, I don't know. People do stuff like that. If you don't know what to do about it and you don't quite have proof that someone did it, what do you do? And I also think at a job like that, where things are just kind of dreadful, you have to have some dark humor. It's how you get through the day. Well, sure. But it wasn't very smart. No. No. And I mean, if you really think he's responsible for it, you find a way to keep observing him. Right, right. But in in a place like Broadmoor, they probably don't have time for that. No, and I think they did try and keep a little bit more of an eye on him, but you're right. I'm sure they were very busy. It wasn't a fun place to work from what I can picture. I'm sure it wasn't. But aside from those poisons, Graham was still obsessed with Hitler and the Nazis. He began making swastikas out of wood and wore them around his neck on a string. He was only 14 years old when he got there, remember. So the doctors, for some reason, mistakenly believed that he would grow out of this Nazi phase. He studied chemistry while he was there, and some of his psychiatrists actually encouraged it, seeing it as a way for him to work toward a university degree and a future career as a scientist. When time passed with no further poisonings, the psychiatrists began to believe that they were making progress with this teen poisoner. But it wasn't just self-control or psychological progress that prevented Graham from poisoning the staff and the inmates. These people were stupid, but not that stupid. No one would drink from a cup that Graham may have had access to. 
So on some level, they knew the danger. At some level. Right. Yes. Graham was moved to a different block in 1967, and there were fewer restrictions in that block. And he had earned more freedom by convincing the staff that he was improving. In 1968, two packets of sugar soap went missing. Sugar soap was a popular cleaning compound at the time. It worked well on scrubbing kitchen surfaces. It looked just like sugar, but it burned human tissue, much like lye does. Which is really bad. And that's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Graham's new block had a large community tea urn. The sugar soap had been added to the urn. Fortunately, it was discovered before anyone ingested it. But the 97 fellow patients on Graham's block were understandably concerned. Of course, Graham was the prime suspect, and he got a thorough beating from some fellow inmates. But they didn't tell the authorities. So Graham was definitely willing and anxious to poison again, given the right opportunity. That's right. So I think that's the only thing that stopped him was he didn't have a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, he was limited in his materials. Access to stuff. Right, yeah. right. Well, of course, his behavior was beyond disturbed. It was dangerous. And there were really signs that he was a potential serial killer. He had many of the characteristics of a serial killer. He was a loner. He had killed animals. He also talked about many violent fantasies. And he really seemed to have no empathy at all. By 1970, his psychiatrist should have seen these red flags, but he just seemed to ignore them or chose not to address them. He just couldn't see beyond Graham's appearance as this model patient and his young age. So he wrote to the Home Secretary for Broadmoor, and he recommended Graham's release. Once Graham realized that he was going to be let out, he started telling the staff members that he was planning to kill someone for each year that he'd been locked up at Broadmoor. This should have raised alarms, but they dismissed it. Yeah, but there were two psychiatrists at Broadmoor who did object quite strongly to Graham's release. They believed that once he was free, he would go back to poisoning people. Unfortunately, these opinions were disregarded. Winnie was contacted by Graham, who wrote to her that her friendly neighborhood Frankenstein would soon be out of Broadmoor. Inexplicably, she was excited about this. Maybe she really believed that her brother was fully recovered. Why wouldn't this young woman believe the psychiatrist, really? I guess. I, I mean, mean, I really feel like the psychiatrist failed here. Well, obviously. Yeah. But he poisoned her. She was that forgiving. Yeah, she just had a very skewed idea about the whole thing, which we'll get into more of that as we get deeper into the case. Winnie even invited Graham to live with her. So when he was released in February of 1971, he moved in with Winnie straight away. Yep, and Winnie was married by this time. She and her husband lived in this new housing development in Hemel Hampstead. But Graham was not the new person described in the psychiatrist's reports. His Hitler obsession was alive and well. He suggested a final solution to the problems in Northern Ireland as well. At this point, there were terrorist attacks going on in the British cities. But Graham's suggestion of genocide was truly crazy. It certainly was. Yeah, but Graham's father, Fred, really wasn't as excited about his son's release. He was much more realistic. Also, he didn't forgive him for killing his wife and for the permanent health issues that he had from his own poisoning. He had lost two wives, and now he was unhealthy and not an old man. Yeah. So he didn't want a relationship with his son, but for the sake of Winnie, he didn't completely reject Graham. Now we know Winnie was extremely trusting. And when, and when Graham ranted about Nazism, she didn't say anything. She didn't speak up either when he said that he was taking a sentimental journey to the pharmacy where he had bought the thallium that he had used to kill his stepmother. So she didn't report any of this to his psychiatrist or any authorities at Broadmoor. <laughs> Jeez. Which okay. could have gotten him locked up again. Probably would have. Yeah. So when visiting his old neighborhood... Graham spoke almost exclusively about how notorious his crimes had been 
and how he had frightened the staff and other inmates at Broadmoor. Not once did he speak about his treatment or how he was going to move forward as a recovered offender. No, he did seem to make an effort to create a new life for himself outside of the hospital. He found a job in Slough, about 15 minutes by bus from Hemel Hempstead. He worked as a trainee storekeeper. And although he was odd and socially awkward to say the least, he was organized and fairly intelligent. Once the commute seemed to be too much for him, he moved into a hostel in Slough. Winnie was actually sad to see him move out, but her husband was relieved. Now he didn't have to listen to rants about Hitler, and he didn't have to worry about poison in his food. So that would be nice. I bet he was happy. Yeah. Right away, one of the hostel's residents, a guy named Trevor Sparks, began to get sick. He started out having nausea and stomach pain. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Graham offered him a glass of wine to help and gave him a full glass. That made Sparks feel worse. His pain worsened, his face swelled up, and he had severe diarrhea. He was very ill, but he was a soccer player, and he forced himself to play until he collapsed on the field. He was taken to the hospital, but no diagnosis was reached. He did survive, but he suffered from severe pain for years afterwards and was never able to play soccer again. So even though he wasn't killed, he was permanently handicapped. Well, and in these cases where someone abuses, kills, hurts people, we always think about the murder victims, and of course we should, and their families and the loss. But you have to think about these people whose lives are forever changed and in many ways ruined. This young man was very into soccer, and he couldn't play anymore after that. So there's not only the suffering and what they go through, but their lives are forever changed and damaged. So, I mean, it's almost as bad as killing someone in many ways. And there was another patient at the Slough Hospital with similar symptoms. And doctors couldn't find an explanation for this illness. But this victim recalled having a drink with a young man who seemed obsessed with chemicals and poison. No one was able to identify Graham as this young man, but it likely was him. The victim was in so much pain and he could not get any relief. And this victim ended up taking his own life. So that to me is a murder. It is. Yeah, that's just tragic. These were young men. Now, not surprisingly, people who spent any time at all with Graham came down with mystery illnesses. But Graham was doing well in his job, and by the spring of 1971, he moved on to a better job, this time with a photographic equipment company. This company was in Bovington, closer to Winnie's house. This seemed like a good move to Winnie, who thought that working in a camera shop wouldn't give him access to any poisons. Uh, au contraire. Yeah, she was very wrong about that. Yes, she was. Now, before he got the job, Graham hit a bump in the road when it came to his references. The store had a lot of expensive equipment, and employees needed to be trustworthy, of course. Graham seemed qualified, but he had eight years missing from his resume. When he was asked about that gap, he explained that his mother had died when he was a teen, and he had suffered a nervous breakdown. He said he had been hospitalized for some time, but recovered. I'm sorry, but for a nervous breakdown, you're not going to go away for eight years. There had to be more to it. You would think so, right? Yes. So the owner contacted the clinic where Graham claimed to have been, but he eventually learned that Graham had actually been a resident of Broadmoor. The psychiatrist at Broadmoor didn't share any details of Graham's situation, but he said that Graham had suffered from a deep-going personality disorder. He emphasized that Graham had had a full recovery. So this information was passed on, with no reference to any poisoning, and Graham was hired. The manager didn't want to hold Graham's past against him, especially since his psychiatrist claimed that he was fully recovered. That was good enough for him. And they were really busy in the factory, working on a large order for the Ministry of Defense. The British Army's battle tanks needed new infrared sights installed, and the company had been awarded a contract to produce the lenses. But they accomplished this with their patented thallium bromide iodide coating. 
So that to me says poison. It does, doesn't it? Yes. So there were some dangerous chemicals there, and I'm sure he was aware of that when he went for the job. Oh, sure. Yeah. In any British workplace, tea breaks are standard. Kind of like the American coffee break, they happen at least twice a day. And the tea is often accompanied by cookies or snacks. Now, Graham had a trainer at his new job, a guy named Ron. Ron was moving on to a more advanced position, so he showed Graham the kitchen, the tea urn, and the tea bags. And then within days, Ron was sick. Graham didn't waste any time, did he? No, he was probably just itching to do it. It had been a while. And it didn't seem like a big deal at first. There had recently been a couple of stomach virus outbreaks at some of the local schools, so Ron wasn't too worried. Then the storeroom manager started to have stomach pains, diarrhea, and nausea. The symptoms lasted for a few days, but then they would come back. Ron had at least 10 episodes in a three-week period. But once he moved on to his new job, the illness just went away permanently. How do you figure? Uh, you know, if you stop ingesting poison, you get better, get better. If you aren't too far gone. Right. Now, the storeroom manager wasn't as lucky as Ron. Each time he returned to work after a sick leave, his illness returned, and it was worse than ever. His fingers became numb, and it spread to his hands and feet. And by the end of a workday, he was in just terrible, unbearable pain. He finally was rushed to the hospital, but by that time he couldn't speak or move his limbs. The doctors diagnosed him with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease that damages the peripheral nervous system and moves into the core of the nervous system. Paralysis moved to his lungs in early July, just 10 days after he was hospitalized, and he died shortly afterward of pneumonia. It's because he couldn't clear his lungs. Right. Well, the staff at the camera store and factory were quite shocked by this. This victim was in his 50s and robustly healthy before he fell ill. He had actually served in World War II and had survived the Dunkirk evacuation. Now he was dead of an unexplained workplace illness. Graham spoke to his fellow employees, saying, It's very sad that Bob came through the terrors of Dunkirk only to fall victim to a strange virus. So Bob was cremated, and that must have been a relief to Graham. It had been his stepmother's cremation after all while her body was filled with thallium that had spared him from being caught years ago. The cremation of his co-worker removed the threat of being discovered for him. Now remember, Graham's not capable of empathy, but he was able to show a false emotional reaction to the co-workers. This worked in the moment, but then after months of him talking about the death, people were just fed up. The others in the factory wanted to put this tragic death behind them, but Graham just enjoyed reliving it and reliving it and getting into details. Well, fortunately, by summer, Graham finally stopped talking about the death. And one of the supervisors named Fred Briggs had befriended Graham. He gave him bus fare and cigarettes when Graham came up short. But not too long after they became friends, Fred Briggs was struck with the same symptoms that had killed the other employee. And this time, the mysterious illness spread like wildfire. Three male employees started vomiting, having leg pain and hair loss. Diana Stewart, the receptionist, had painful feet and noticed that they smelled strange and awful. Yeah, and they never were able to determine what caused that symptom. They think it must have been something different. Possibly. But he dabbled in all kinds of poisons. So some people stuck with this stomach virus theory, but others were becoming worried and suspicious. They wondered if maybe the water supply was contaminated, or if military experiments at a nearby military base were causing the illnesses. But then a man named Jethro Bat began to think about a cup of coffee Graham Young had given him. He said it had been so bitter that he threw it out after one sip, and then the symptoms took hold. As the summer turned to autumn, illnesses in the company became more widespread and serious. Jethro had recovered from his first illness, then it returned ten times worse. 
and within two days he had pain that was so intolerable he was considering killing himself just to get relief. Fred Biggs was in even worse shape. His skin was peeling off, and he couldn't even tolerate the weight of a sheet on his body. Now, he was in the hospital until November, showed some initial grief improvement, and then died on November 19th. Yes, yeah, so this camera company had suffered two deaths in just a few months. As you can imagine, employees were worried and just desperate to find out what was causing these illnesses. Yeah, because remember, nobody knew Bram's past. No, it was hidden from them, actually, by the psychiatrist. So Diana, the receptionist with the smelly feet, wrote a memo to the director saying that Graham was a germ carrier and she thought he was responsible for the illnesses. She pointed out how the illnesses began when Graham was hired and that most of those affected had worked very closely with him. So she was really getting close to the truth, but then unfortunately her focus on germs worked against her credibility. She suggested that Graham had caught germs from his Pakistani roommates, so her memo was dismissed as being racist. After the November 19th death of Fred Briggs, a local doctor named Anderson called a meeting with the staff. Anderson told the camera factory employees that the building had been thoroughly examined and nothing hazardous or toxic had been found. One of the clerks, actually Graham himself, began asking some tough questions of the doctor. He wanted to know how thallium poisoning had been ruled out as the cause. The symptoms matched exactly. Hair loss, nerve damage, stomach pain, vomiting, and an agonizing death. Now, this demonstration on Graham's part of the knowledge of thallium poisoning surprised the doctor, and it immediately led him to suspect Graham. The doctor contacted the supervisor, who in turn notified the police. Graham had done himself in, didn't he? Got people suspicious against himself by showing off his knowledge of toxins. Yeah, but I feel like he really couldn't resist showing off. Well, of course not. He was just so obsessed with it. So his psychiatrist from Broadmoor, Dr. Edgar Budwin, had hidden Graham's records from his new employer, mostly in order to help him succeed. But once the police were involved, they got access to the full records. The investigation confirmed that the illness had struck the company within three weeks of Graham coming on board. The victim's symptoms were explained to forensic scientists and found to be consistent with thallium poisoning. Detectives informed the factory manager about how he was misled into hiring a convicted killer who had used thallium when he was still a child to murder his own stepmother. So this was shocking. Who would expect that? Then two days after the, <clears throat> two days after the police were contacted, Graham went to his father's house in Kent to visit his aunt. And while he was there, police went to his boarding house and searched his room. And what a shock. The walls were covered with pictures of Hitler, dead bodies, and people in agony with bottles labeled poison. And on the windowsill, there were bottles and vials filled with gray metallic powder. And underneath the bed, they found the mother load, Graham's diary. Yeah, so this diary was a large notebook labeled a student's and officer's casebook. Officers looked through the pages and were just completely unnerved. Graham had written down the doses of poison he had given to his victims and their subsequent symptoms. So as Fred Biggs was in the hospital dying, Graham had written that F was responding to treatment. He is obstinately difficult, he wrote. If he survives the third week, he will live. I am most annoyed. So imagine the shock of finding this thing. I know. Well, even more. I mean, beside each of the victim's names, Graham wrote whether or not he intended for that person to die or just to suffer. Wow. And the diary showed that since he had been released, Graham had poisoned 70 people, and there were plans to poison more people. He wrote about his plan to visit a co-worker in the hospital, and offer him a drink from his flask of brandy and thallium. Now, because drinking alcohol is not allowed at the hospital, Graham felt confident that the co-worker wouldn't tell anybody. And he also had begun using different poisons, including antimony and arsenic, in order to confuse the investigators. 
Right, so what they found in Graham's room was enough to convince them that Graham was the murderer and the poisoner of these people. They located him at his father's house and arrested him that same day, taking him away in handcuffs. So Fred, his father, was just disgusted to hear that Graham was still poisoning people. Remember, he really hadn't wanted to forgive him or bring him back. So after they left with his son, Fred was done with Graham for good. He tore up his birth certificate and any photos or anything reminding him of him. He didn't want to know anything more about it. And just imagine the pain that is his child. And he has to realize that he's just a horrible human being. Responsible for a lot of deaths and a lot of illness. Right, including his wife's death and his really damaged health. That's right. Graham had a vial of thallium in his coat pocket when he was arrested, too. He claimed that this was his exit dose in case he was caught, but I think that was really unlikely. Thallium poisoning was a horrible way to die, and no one knew that better than Graham. It's more likely that he kept the thallium on him in case he had a chance to give it to someone, because he was always looking for an opportunity to poison people. Yeah, I think that's the way to interpret that. Yeah, absolutely. Because he... He's not going to want himself to suffer too much. No, it's horrible. It just sounds horrible. Now, once he was in police custody, Graham was very talkative. He bragged about killing his stepmother, calling it the perfect crime. But he also said he would deny everything in court. He seemed to believe he was immune to prosecution. He even wrote to one of his cousins that he had a good chance for acquittal because the prosecutor's case was so weak. He had kept up on the science of poisoning, but he didn't seem particularly well-versed in recent advances in forensic science. No, because his confidence was not accurate. He finally did go to trial that summer of 1972. He was charged with murdering the war veteran and Fred Biggs as well as the attempted murder of several other people. By British law, the jury couldn't be told about his earlier convictions or the time he spent in Broadmoor. The prosecution had detectives testify about Graham's confessions and the diary entries, but Graham wasn't going to go down without a fight. He really thought he was going to get away with this. He did admit to his confessions, but he said that he had only told the police what they wanted to hear because they were withholding food from him. The case was absurd, he said. He said the diary entries were all from his imagination, and he'd been writing it down in preparation for a crime novel he planned to write. So there was no evidence proving that any of his co-workers had been poisoned by him. The war veteran had been cremated, and Fred Biggs, he said, likely misused some thallium that Graham had given him to kill bugs in his yard. No motive could be defined for Graham poisoning 70 people and killing two of them. He was convinced that he could not be convicted without a proven motive, but his motive was that he enjoyed causing pain and death, and you don't need to prove a motive to convict someone. That's right. And of course, Graham's assumption was wrong. With such strong evidence, again, the motive was not necessary, and the prosecution was very confident about their ability to win the case. Back when Molly Young had died of thallium poisoning in 1962, it had been impossible to gather evidence. But the ashes of the war veteran were run on a mass spectrometer and found to be full of thallium. Uh Yeah, so he didn't know they could do that. Nope. The widow of Fred Biggs testified that her husband had never used thallium in their yard or even brought any home. And the initials of the victims, which he called patients, matched the initials in his diary. The people had suffered from the same symptoms that he had written in his diary as well, so it all matched. The prosecution had also found the source of Graham's poisons. He had gone into London and bought thallium and antimony from a pharmacy. Using a fake ID, Graham conned the pharmacist into selling him the lethal metals, saying that he needed them for a chemistry experiment. So this clearly showed criminal intent. Yeah, and then, of course, the, the trial was very attractive to the media. And the newspapers gave him the nickname, the teacup poisoner. Graham loved the notoriety. He was so confident and certain he would not be convicted. 
but it must have been quite a shock for him when the jury returned with their verdict. Yeah, he was found guilty for the murders of the war veteran and Fred Biggs. He was also found guilty of two attempted murders and two counts of administering poison. The jury also expressed concern about the sale of poison needing to be better regulated. So once the verdict was in, Graham's record was released to the court and the public. So everybody found out about his history, and the jurors learned for the first time how he had poisoned his family and killed his stepmom. Graham's defense attorney spoke up, telling the press that it was only possible for Graham to commit his offenses because they had released him from Broadmoor. Even his own attorney had been relieved that he would be off the streets, and the judge was in full agreement. So he sentenced Graham to four life sentences plus two five-year sentences for the charges of administering poison. And after the verdict, it was announced that two new inquiries would be scheduled to look into mental patients after they were released. Guidelines needed to be developed so others like Graham wouldn't be able to leave Broadmoor and enter the population with no one knowing about their crimes and with them being free to repeat them. So this time, instead of Broadmoor, Graham was sent to Her Majesty's Prison Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight. In 1972, Parkhurst was used to house the most dangerous convicts. But the Isle of Wight itself isn't like Alcatraz. It's a 148-square-mile island off the southern coast of England, and it's actually best known for its coastal resorts, as well as a prestigious yacht club. It's best known to me as an American from the Beatles song, When I'm 64. But Parkhurst was home for some of England's most evil prisoners. And in 1972, Graham Young became one of them. Parkhurst was probably a rude awakening for Graham. He lived in fear of his life on a daily basis. Prison was different from Broadmoor in that the inmates were much more vicious. Many of them saw their own crimes as very different from Graham's. Graham was seen as a psychotic scumbag who killed his own stepmother, just for kicks. And other inmates, some of them anyway, saw Graham as a person to avoid at all costs. They were afraid that he would poison them in their tea or their food, and they were ready to kill him for the first sign of him getting up to his old tricks. Now in prison, Graham made a friend who was just as evil as he was. In 1963, a 16-year-old girl named Pauline Reed left her parents' home for a dance in the suburb of Manchester. She never made it to the dance because on her way she met a neighbor named Myra Hindley and a guy she introduced as her boyfriend, Ian Brady. Pauline died an hour later, with her clothes torn off and her throat slashed. Then that November, a 12-year-old boy was lured into Myra Hindley's car, molested and strangled. And in June of 1964, another 12-year-old suffered the same fate, And six months later, 10-year-old Ann Downey disappeared from a fairground. She was raped and killed in the house of Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. Yeah, so this is a case they call the Moore Murders with Hindley and Brady. And this is a case I've decided I'd like to cover soon. Horrible, but fascinating. So in 1965, Brady invited a 17-year-old named Edward Evans to their home and beat him to death with an axe. Myra Hindley's brother-in-law witnessed this murder, and he called the police. The next morning, Myra and Ian were both arrested. Myra Hindley was convicted of two murders, and she received a life sentence. Ian Brady was sent to Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital, but then ended up at Parkhurst with Graham Young. The friendship of Ian Brady and Graham Young was a true match made in hell. Both were obsessed with killing for fun, and both loved Nazis. The two played chess every day together and talked for hours about their favorite Nazis. Brady wrote a dreadful autobiography in 2001, and in this book he compared Graham Young to Hermann Goering and Joseph Mengele. In August of 1990, Graham Young was found dead in his prison cell. The recorded cause of death was a heart attack, but there was speculation that he had been poisoned either by himself or a fellow prisoner. Ian Brady suggested that Graham had killed himself as some kind of brave gesture to free himself from imprisonment. Anyway, whatever did kill him, it turned out to be a quick death, and he didn't suffer like the suffering he had caused his victims. 
Yeah, there were a few books written about Graham Young's poisoning murders. Graham's sister Winnie wrote a book she titled The Obsessive Poisoner. So it's an interesting book in that it offers this inside perspective. But she really was unwilling or unable to accept that her brother was a bad guy. Her insistence that Graham had a good relationship with his stepmother that he killed is really difficult to understand. There's another book titled The Teacup Prisoner, written by Fergus Mason. It's a short book, less than 200 pages, but it's full of accurate information about Graham and his crimes. Finally, there's another book called The St. Albans Poisoner, The Life and Crimes of Graham Young. So there's plenty to read on this. Then as a footnote, in 2005, a 17-year-old girl in Japan was arrested after her mother went into a coma and died from thallium poisoning. The girl's blog had photos of her ill mother during phases of the poisoning. She also described how thallium had been put into her tea. She wrote about experiments she did on animals. And when police discovered the blog, they searched the girl's house and found the remains of animals. Their bodies were full of thallium and preserved in formaldehyde. And she owned a biography of Graham Young. Yeah, when trying to determine why Graham did what he did, Psychologists found no abuse in his childhood. Some of his victims he did dislike, but many were just chosen at random. He described his poisonings as experiments, but I have to say that's total bullshit. He knew what would happen to his victims, and he really enjoyed observing their suffering. He really seemed to like the power he felt by taking people's lives into his hands. Basically, he killed because he liked it and he had no empathy for other people. Really nothing redeemable about this person. So our sources for this case are the books, The Teacup Poisoner, The St. Albans Poisoner, and The Obsessive Poisoner. There's also an article in the journal Criminal Behavior and Mental Health from 1996 by Paul Bowden. So this is just an amazing case, isn't it? It's almost beyond belief. It is, but I take some solace, and I don't think this could be repeated. I think our forensics have come far enough so he would be caught the first time. Probably. <laughs> so you're not convinced. I mean, you'd have to be in, uh, be suspicious of it. Right. That the person had been poisoned. But I feel like now if someone gets sick, they're going to find the poison usually. If they think about it. Yes. And if they find the poison... Well, then they got him. Then they got him, yeah. But I think there's still maybe a good number of physicians, medical people, hospitals, where that's not something that would enter into your differential diagnosis. Sure, I would hope it's very unusual and rare. Plus, there's the type of poison you use, because some of them are easier to find than others. I really feel like antifreeze is a very popular one with murderers from what I've seen in my little bit of experience. Yeah, but that's easy to identify, though. So. Yeah. Okay, well, TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you do enjoy listening to our shows, I hope you'll consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen. It takes a few minutes, but we really appreciate it, and it helps new listeners to find our show. Before we get into feedback, just a word about our TCB store. With the holidays coming up, if you're looking for a gift or a stocking stuffer, we have some merch you can buy. We're in a partnership with Tee Public, so the prices are very reasonable because, of course, they can buy the products in bulk and really high quality. I love the sweatshirts and the t-shirts. I even bought myself a tote bag, which is great. So what have you got for feedback, Dick? I have a few emails for you. Three, to be precise. Okay, you want to read the first one? The first one is from Patty, and it's a case suggestion. Hey there, just wanted to say thank you for sharing your time and talents with us listeners. I truly enjoy and anxiously await each episode. I follow several other crime podcasts, but True Crime Brewery is my favorite. The case I would like to submit for possible review is that of New Freedom, Pennsylvania resident Greg Whitman. In 1998, at age 15, Greg was found guilty of brutally murdering his 13-year-old brother, Zachary, and he received a life sentence with no possibility of parole. 
Greg and his parents have always maintained his innocence, and due to his age at the time the crime was committed, he was able to plead to a lesser charge, and in so doing was granted parole in 2020. YouTube channel Killzone recently released a documentary film on this case, and it's extremely interesting. Thank you again for your time and effort each episode requires, and I appreciate you both. Thank you, Patty. That's great. So what do we know about this case? Well, there was, it occurred in 1998 in October, and it was actually Zach who was the 15-year-old, and Greg was the 13-year-old. Zach killed his brother. He stabbed him over 100 times, nearly decapitated him. Zach was sentenced to life in prison without parole, and this was later downgraded to 20 to 40 years in prison. In 2018, Zach did confess to the murder of his brother, and in 2019, he was released on parole. So there has to be a lot behind this, obviously. Yeah, because the little bit I've read so far seemed like some minor slight perceived by Zach that made him kill his brother, and he really went off on his brother. Yeah, that's just, I don't know how to feel about it because it sounds like a terrible crime, but then I also have an issue with a 15-year-old getting life in prison. That seems, I don't know, that's a tough one. So it would definitely make for an interesting discussion. I'm sure it is extremely interesting. I just have to wonder about the parents and how they dealt with all this. Oh, I know. All right, so our next email is a case suggestion from Teresa. Teresa writes, Back in 1966, when I was in junior high school, there was a brutal murder in Riverside, California, at Riverside City College. The victim was a college freshman for the fall semester in 1966. Her name was Sherry Jo Bates. The case remains unsolved. However, the so-called Zodiac Killer took credit for her murder. It was heard that the Zodiac Killer enjoyed taking credit for killings regardless I, for one, don't believe the Zodiac did it. I believe it was someone who either Sherry knew or someone who felt slighted by her. You know men and their fragile egos. Or maybe someone who just wanted to kill a young woman or may have been a stalker, too. We just don't know. Sherry had just graduated high school in 1966 from Ramona High School in Riverside. She was very attractive and a real catch. She was a varsity cheerleader and a homecoming princess while at Ramona High. I have always been very curious about her murder. It was vicious, and lots of clues were left behind at the college where she was murdered. She had gone to the college library to study and check out some books. The library closed at 9, and she was discovered by a janitor early the next morning in a dirt driveway between two empty houses on the campus. Laying near her was a Timex watch with the wristband broken, boot prints, grease handprints, and fingerprints on the driver's side window and engine compartment in the back of Sherry's green 1960 VW Bug. The murderer disabled her car and then approached her, possibly to see if he could assist her or offer her a ride. No one knows what he said to her, of course, but she went with him. It was rumored that he said to her, Hey, It looks like a good time, and Sherry said, a good time for what? And he said, to die. I'm hoping you will choose to look into this 54-year-old case. It just needs more attention. Parts of Sherry's murder were mentioned in the movie Zodiac from recent years. Well, Teresa, thank you so much, and that does sound fascinating. It does. I think she's giving us too much credit, though, in terms of solving the case or giving well i don't think she's thinking we'll solve it i think she might we might give it some attention but we're not super famous or anything so that's right (laughs) but we definitely would love to discuss it i like that case yeah i thought it'd be interesting yeah i always enjoy the older cases yeah so thanks again teresa and we have one more email one final email and this is from amelia and it's a little different because she has a book suggestion nice So she says, Hi, Dick and Jill, long-time listener here. I wanted to give a book recommendation because it really helps me look at cases in a more informed way, and it rings true to a lot of what you mentioned. Kind of an older book, and you may have already heard of it or read it. It's called The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker. I thought of it again this week when Jill mentioned about how Leanne Fletcher's mom joked about her husband taking out insurance on her. Jill is always a champ at reading all the true crime books. 
Gavin mentions in his book that joking is actually one of our senses that we need to listen to. So it might sound like a joke, but there's some substance behind it. Oh, absolutely. I believe that. This book is awesome, and I would highly recommend it. Also, I love your podcast so much and look forward to listening every Tuesday morning. Being from Colorado, I'm a huge craft beer fan. And Dick, I also love Founders. Their breakfast beers are everything. (laughs) Thank you for everything you do and all the hard work you put into your show. Have a wonderful holiday season. Thanks again. So what was her name again? This is Amelia. Beautiful name. Well, thank you, Patty and Teresa and Amelia. And it's my favorite part of the podcast, feedback. Well, of course. (laughs) Look who does it. (laughs) But yes, that book that Amelia was talking about, I have heard of that book, I think, years and years ago. The author was on Oprah Winfrey, and it was an all-female audience, and he was telling people, trust your instincts. So I'm totally on board with that. Like, if you see someone in an elevator, don't be polite and get in if he gives you the creeps. Follow your instincts. Right. Yep. And I think that with Leanne, there were a lot of signs, but that's the thing with people. They just think bad things aren't going to happen to them. It right. happens to someone else. It's someone else. And don't be dramatic or, of course, that's not going to happen. And that's just a really good example with Leanne saying, oh, mom, he's not going to shoot me. Hours before her husband shot her to death. Yeah. Yeah. It's really eerie. I would just say to Amelia, as a craft beer fan, that we've been a few times to Colorado. Not recently, of course. I know. We miss it. But Denver a couple times and Boulder once for a niece's wedding. So I think next time we come, we'll give you a call. Yeah, we'd love to drink beer with you. Maybe we could schedule some kind of meetup with a few people. But, you know. Yeah, let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's off in the future a ways, I know. Let's get to a point where we can travel again. (laughs) I know. So. Well, thanks everyone for listening. And thanks again for feedback. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. We'll be there. We'll look for you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.